Hello coaches, today we're joined by Stefan Peter to talk about a really, really important topic, helping young players through the stresses and pressure of competitive elite soccer. Stefan grew up in Austria, former player and now is a coach, does a lot of his work online, has some great special offers. If you enjoy this video, please of course give it a like and subscribe. But if you enjoy Stefan's perspective, please check out his resources. His website is full of free content, free workbooks. He's also got a special offer for Modern Soccer Coach listeners. On the link below, please check it out. Stefan's insight's brilliant. It's a really, really important topic. Here's Stefan. Enjoy. Stefan, thank you for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Delighted to have you on. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm a bit excited to be honest. It's my first podcast interview. I've, I, I usually do um, I usually do a lot of um, speaking in front of audiences, um, but um, never been on a podcast. So yeah, Brilliant. I'm happy to be here. Oh, excited to hear that. No better place to start than the modern soccer coach. So <laughs> here, um, I'm going to tell everyone our title. So our title today is stress and pressure for young players. What can we do to help and I suppose the first question that I wanted to kick this off for you was 2022. Why do you think we're at a time where there is so much pressure and so much stress uh, for for young players around the world? Yeah, I mean, there are there are probably some very obvious reasons to that. Um, and there are some reasons that might not be that obvious. I mean, we all know that um, pe- that people are able to... Uh, to see the whole world with just a click. So I'm talking about all those kind of obvious pressures that are that are growing within our society. And that's not only a phenomenon for 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 young athletes um, that we get assessed by social media basically every day. And um, of course, within those spaces, there is a huge glorification of of, of pro athletes. And um, yeah, when then sometimes you have overambitious parents that just put a lot of stress and, 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 and pressure on their athletes or on their kids, as I have experienced myself. And um, yeah, then there is media, there is the interest of the club, there is the interest of the sponsors. So as we all know, the whole system of um, the whole football system or, or the whole soccer system has really been commercialized. Um, yeah, those, I would say, are the obvious reasons that we are all aware of. You don't have to be a coach to be aware of that. But I think then there are also some reasons that are not that obvious in at first. And um, maybe if we just look at the fact that when a young player decides, for example, to to join an academy and to leave his home to have this this big change of environment to have a change in friends to um not seeing his family as much as he'd like to probably or maybe even um the first loss of a romantic relationship then this is on top of that this sort of stress and 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 pressure that comes along with this sudden change so i think this is a this is a huge part for or that this is a huge reason why there is so much stress on 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 young athletes and um especially because they have never been equipped for for this change i mean if we look at if we look at the reason why we as athletes started to to play soccer or to start with any kind of uh, sports i always take the comparison of of a young kid that that built a lego tower you know we all have this in mind when we were kids and we were playing with lego we just did it because we loved it right and it didn't matter to us how high the tower was at first and even when we finished the tower we with the same excitement and with the same love as we built the tower we destroyed the whole the whole thing then when we start to compare each other to other people then we suddenly start to realize okay there is it 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 makes a difference in our emotions and in our way how we uh, how we feel pressure when it suddenly gets important how high the tower gets 
yeah, and then we start to think what happen what happens if we if we don't achieve the dreams that we have, what um, what's the what's the positive negative outcome? You know, we start to ask those questions as as we as we grow older. Obviously, people develop and and at different rates. Some people find it hard at the tough at the start. Some people excel at the start, and and everyone's at different pathways. And we're getting more education, more awareness about that as coaches. What are some telltale signs from a psychological standpoint or observational standpoint to see about how a player is struggling and maybe getting there a little bit earlier than than we would normally get there to help? Yeah, obviously there are many signs. I just take those those signs that are the most obvious for me in my experience. And um, for me, it was like the first sign that, that I experienced and that I also, also see with my athletes is when they suddenly stop to enjoy winning for some reason, mm-hmm. right? And when they, when they are restless, when they have trouble falling asleep, um, when they start sleeping in in the day, like even when they, when they are in, in situations talking to teammates, talking to the coaching staff, and suddenly they have a huge emotional reaction, much stronger than someone who is not struggling at the moment would not have such a, such a huge emotional reaction. And this could be a sign, for example. Yeah, or if they are just over fearful, like they just basically fear everything in life. They fear life in general. Or uh, this one is, is, is very common as well when they start blaming others for, for not performing, like when they start blaming the coach or when they start blaming the circumstances, when they suddenly realize they are not performing anymore. Those are the, the main things that come into my mind. We always ask as coaches when we do the technical or the exercises or practices, we always get asked, or we often get asked, what age group is this applicable to? So one of the questions I had for you is, is what age group do you think coaches should start to get their awareness a little bit higher when they're working with players to have that anxiety or to be on the lookout for these things and to be uh, maybe conscious of how they're talking about it and addressing it? Yeah, I mean, we can look at life in general in, um, in a phase of seven years. For every for every human being, we have like our life can be divided into seven and into cycles or circles of, of, of seven years. So after seven years, often there is a, a big change in life. And um, so for, I would say this starts around puberty, but around the age of 14, 15, that's more or less the, the age group. We talk a lot about in the coaching again we're getting more information as coaches get to know your players understand your players spend time building connections with your players but for coaches that are maybe only getting access to players once or twice a week and they don't have an assistant coach or they're just maybe they have access two or three more times but they've 20 something players (laughs) and what are some ways or what are some tricks of the trade that coaches can can build these relationships efficiently, even if they're understaffed or don't have the time? Or is there a way? Yeah. What I want to say is try to see the, the, the player, not as a player first, but as a kid first. Try to see them as human beings first, because we are human beings, right? We are, it's not... We put on the role of the soccer player, we put on the role of the musician, we put on the role of the CEO, but in the end, we are human beings. And this always influences each, each other, right? Your, um, so this is, this is for me, in, in my work as a coach, I always try to um, make sure that my coachee feels that I see him or her as the, as, as the person he or she is as the human being he or she is and not as the athlete first. I think also to as a as a coach we try to we try to think that we have to know everything 
and that we are blessed with all the knowledge and that we always know what's best for our players. But in my experience, it, re it really helps when you ask them questions. And what, what this will do is they will immediately feel that they are taken serious. And if you look back to when we were 12, 13, 14, I mean, all I wanted at that age was I wanted to be taken serious by the grown-ups. I wanted to grow up myself and I wanted to be independent. And I always felt amazing when a grown-up would ask me what I feel, what I think, what I just, what I just experienced. So this is to me like a really important thing that we can do as, as coaches and also say, I remember, have you seen the documentary about Pep Guardiola and, and Manchester City? Yes, the Amazon one, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember one scene where he is in the dressing room and, and, and he tells all of his players, he tells them, you know guys, I don't know every I don't know everything and sometimes um sometimes even I fail and and but I try you know but you have to understand that even I as a coach sometimes I don't know everything and that's something um just to be honest yeah with your own flaws yeah. it's funny because th there's a few times in that series that he actually says, he, once there's a player sent off and he said, right, he's got to take a player off. And he's like, I'm, I don't know. I don't have the answers. Uh, and he uses this almost as a defense mechanism to almost relate to the players. <laughs> but I laugh because my coach's hat said that if you lost five games in a row and you go in there and say, I don't know the answers, guys, your credibility is out the window, you know? So it's, yeah, yeah. Sometimes That's difficult. a fine tuning. That's a fine yeah. tune, right? Of course, you cannot, you cannot be a coach and at the same time tell your players all the time that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you mean. I know what you mean because, but, but we actually do the opposite is that we, you know, you're asking for a little bit more humility there. We actually, as coaches, um, that yeah. pressure, we talk about pressure, stress, anxiety, the pressure to have all the answers or to perceive that you have all the answers can actually yeah. can actually land the player in a in a in a diff difficult spot mentally is what you're saying yeah absolutely when you feel like for example that the whole team is super nervous you could also like maybe afterwards you could address okay guys i felt that you were nervous but you know what even i in that moment i was nervous but you know what i did Bam, bam, bam. That's what I did, and that's what helped me. And then the players go like, ah, okay. Even my coach is only human, and they can relate. They can relate to you as to you as a human being. And this builds emotional intelligence. This will build emotional intelligence players. And this is doing something extraordinary in a in a team because if you have many emotional intelligence players in your team, you know what's going to happen. They will also be able to be more respectful more understanding they will have more trust towards the other members of the team and they will support they will support each other much more and this makes the whole work as a head coach much much easier because then suddenly if if i as a player trust my teammates i can trust them with my own weaknesses i can go to my captain of the team and i can let him know Hey man, I just felt really bad during this game. I had the feeling like my body language went really bad. Um, can you do me a favor? The next time that you feel like my body language goes really bad, can you give me some sort of a sign? Just like as you would tell me when I have a player in the back of, a, of my mind, give me some sign that my body language goes bad, right? And this builds a lot of trust within the whole team and you don't need to love all of your teammates but if you are able to to make them trust each other and to make them respect each other that's going to make our work as coaches your work as a head coach that's going to make it much easier we talked before about the differences in in the culture over here especially in the US and I know it's quite similar in the UK where they've got the pressure now on elite performance from a 
I suppose, elite coaching to where you're creating these academies and you're trying to get players to another level, another level, uh, the pathway leading to the professional level. So pressure that we know, if we reverse engineer it, pressure is going to be there when they arrive close to or definitely in and around the professional level. And I think a lot of coaches struggle with the fact that, like, Anything we want to coach and expose players to something that they're going to see later on. So the technical demands, the tactical demands, the physical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now the mental demands will involve pressure. How can a coach expose young players to expectations in a healthy way at a young level and almost build that in a way that you know doesn't doesn't make it very, very difficult or too difficult for the player? That's a great question because I think that's one of the hardest things that you can do as a coach because every player is so different and what works with one player, it's not guaranteed that it's going to work with, with the next player the same. Um, but in my experience, um, it's similar to what I said before. It's um, making the player be aware of the fact that he or she is not defined by his performance, right? He's not defined by the wins that he is able to achieve, but neither the losses. But what we define a player or how we define a player is how he reacts in moments when he gets de defeated, how he reacts in moments when he, when he wins, how he supports the rest of the team, how he communicates, with the coaching stuff, how he is like acting outside of of the of an academy, how he is presenting himself on social media, those are the things. But those are very human things. So I think if you're if you're able to to make a player understand that he does not become a better person, a better human being, just because he is winning. But at the same time, he's also not becoming a, a, a worse person if, if he is losing. I think this takes away a lot of the stress already, right? 100%. 100%. Um, you, you, when you were a young player, I read that you had played with or your dad was your goalkeeper. You were a goalkeeper. Your dad was your coach. Talk about because because that's another dynamic over here. The the parental influence, and again, it's coming into play, I think, across the world at the minute, more parental influences. How was that experience for you from both the positive and negative standpoint? Um, I think the most positive influence on, on my dad being my coach was he demanded a lot. <laughs> so this made me a performer. I was always trying to to be as good as possible and I was a hard worker and I was really um, I was really disciplined you know and I think that was the that was the thing that I that I can take away as a positive thing from that um, but at the same time I put a I put a lot of pressure on myself as well because unfortunately the thing was whenever whenever I was not performing my dad would not show me love. He would make sure that, or he didn't do it consciously, you know, but, un but unconsciously, um, he didn't talk to me if I didn't play well. Um, he, was, he would like, if, if I wouldn't go to, to training, he would ignore me for two days. He wouldn't, he wouldn't talk a word to me. So I, you know, I kind of like created this anxiousness of support, of, of, of disappointing my dad. And this was really hard for me because at the same time, at a young age, I felt this love for, for the game. And, and, then it, at, and then suddenly like the pressure became more and more and more. And I just, I just didn't know how to navigate through all those pitfalls as a young player um involving my dad as my coach interesting it, it brings us along nicely with with parents you know this this parent structure and i'm sure there's a lot of people 
a lot of players that have similar, um, you know, 12, even earlier than 12 over here, I would say there's players that are, you know, that if they have a bad game, they hear it in the car or else their parent acts differently when they get home. Do you think clubs should be working alongside parents from a psychological point of view? Um, yeah, for certain players, I think that's, that's really important. And for me, luckily, I had the feeling that my, my, my goalkeeper coach, so my dad would coach me for a certain period of time. And when I, when I turned 12, he would hire a professional coach for me, but he would still be behind the goal. So he would act as a second coach, something like that. And the lucky thing was that I had the feeling that my professional coach, he would pick up this, this sort of um, relationship that I had with my father, this kind of difficult relationship in, in, in this sense. And he would try to really be the, pop, be the good cop. He would try to really assure me and, and give me positive feedback. And he would make me feel as he as if he sees me and he understands and he wouldn't he wouldn't judge me if i make if i if i, if I made mistakes or so so i think yes it's important for um for certain athletes to to take the parent in this sort of triangle of success if you want because parents can be a huge influence on on young athletes both positive and negative Right. So if you if you as a parent, if you're very if you're very supportive and and very understanding and you really and you're emotionally intelligent, as I would say, um, then you would make your kid feel good, even if he did mistakes, because the thing is, no one does mistakes on purpose. We even like language even tells us we make we make mistakes, right? But um, or mistakes happen, but we never do them consciously. There are always two reasons why mistakes happen. Only two reasons. The first reason being that you are not having the skill set to manage the task that you're required to do. Then you need to work on your skill set. Okay. And the second reason is. The second reason is that you are um, you are not in the present moment. You're not concentrated enough. Your mind goes drifts away because you think this this situation is too easy. Then you're not concentrated, and then you need to work on your mindset. You need to work on your concentration. You need to work on being present in the moment. Let's talk about emotion set. It's a word that you created. Tell me what it is. Tell me how we can work on it. I mean, for me, the emotion set is kind of like the, the, the counterpart or not the counterpart. It's um, in addition to the mindset. So um, the emotion set for me is psychologists use the word emotional intelligence. This, is, this means how well you cope with stress situations, how you deal with failure, how you deal with success how your how you manage your 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 own emotions and and um how much awareness you have for for your own limiting beliefs and the things that block you this is what i understand when from or this is what i understand um when i talk about the emotion set so when then your website you're offering a free session which is an unbelievable deal for, for any player, you know, to, to connect with you. What's the starting point with that emotion set? What does that first session look like? What type of questions are you asking? And Yeah, so it's, it's usually it's a Zoom call um, mm-hmm. where the main, the main target is to, um, to get to know each other and to give the player or the athlete the, the feeling that I see him as a person. So this is because this this immediately builds a strong a strong connection and a strong a strong trust towards each other. And basically, what I do is is I 
I, I listen a lot during this first um, during this first Zoom call. I try to ask a lot of questions. I try not to to give advice um, because I feel like as a coach, there is a reason why we have two ears and only one mouth. In many cases, this already helps a lot. If people have the feeling that they can talk about their feelings, that they can talk about their emotions, and someone is actually listening, and instead of giving advice immediately, because that's what they usually get, um, I'm trying to ask, I'm trying to ask questions, and I'm trying to find out together with the player um, what the feeling is truly about. You know, because in many cases um, people cannot really um, cannot really specify or can, cannot really assign the feeling they have right now. It just doesn't feel. They just don't feel well. They just feel like something is off. They feel like this sort of feeling lost, right? They, they don't know um, where they're going. They don't know why it's not working anymore. They don't know why the pressure is, is, is influencing them so much. And in this certain period, you know, it's super hard to see the end of the tunnel. It's super hard in this moment to, to um, yeah, to to see the whole the whole point of it, and um, a good a good starting point in this conversation is always the symptoms that our body tries to send us. In many times, or or, or in, in 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 many cases, um, people will have physical symptoms. So, for example, if someone, a lot of athletes, if they suffer from a lot of pressure and a lot of stress and anxiety as well. They will have problems with their digest with their di digestion. A lot of those those pressures and a lot of these anxiety um, get stored, or, or or the symptoms that we feel is often coming from our gut, from our um, yeah, from our from our digestive system. But it doesn't need to be this sort of symptom. It, it can be other symptoms as well. And what I'm trying to do is to find out the feeling that the player has in the moment, what kind of symptom is the body sending in this moment? Because our body is, is much, like an, like, much like an indicator board. It has all those lamps and um, a symptom that only means the lamp is, is lighting up. Just like when you look at your car and the car tells you that you need to refill oil, you know exactly that if you put water in the car, it's not gonna make it. It's not gonna make it any better. But also, it will not work if you if you destroy the blinking lights of the of, of of the indicator board in your car. This will also not take away the real the real thing that that is behind the symptom. And this is what we do in so many cases when we take um, a lot of medicine. Or whenever our body tries to send us a signal, and especially when those signals become chronic, then we should really try to listen to those signals. And then we should really try to find out, and these are the questions that I'm asking, to make it easier to find out what this symptom really stands for from an emotional point of view. To put it on one, in one word, that's psychosomatic. Right, but if you if you have the right set of questions, um, it's much easier to get to the to the real cause for your underperforming. And this is what I tried to do in the first in the first um, tell us in in the first Zoom call already. And then I would try to go on and explain the whole the whole method, the other steps, and try to outline the how it's possible to go from this feeling that you're currently feeling. How it's possible to go and create a complete new vision for your life that gives you back this kind of energy or this kind of spark that you see in people's eyes when they really enjoy doing something. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do in the first in the first uh, Zoom call. In your ebook, which is also free on your website, um, I had a good read of that. There, you outline the things that you want to work on almost in a timeline 
And in week yeah. two, you said, and I'll quote, in order to perform, you have to accept what is. And I thought that was really interesting. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role of acceptance for an athlete? Yeah, for me, this is this is one of the most exciting and one of the most important things that you can do, not only as an athlete, but as a human being in general. Because what that does is if you if you have the ability to accept what is for a moment, it takes you from a from a victim to a creator in the blink of an eye right whereas if you are not able to accept what is what are you doing in this moment you are rejecting you are um you don't want it to be true whatever happens that leads to your emotions and to your feelings right you're trying to push it away you're saying no to it but what this does is in this moment when you're not accepting you're stuck you're going nowhere. You are stuck in the situation and in the feeling that you are. And this is where the downward spiral begins for people, right? This is where it's, get, where it, where it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So, and I'm not saying that acceptance means that you need to like what, ex, what you've experienced. That's not the same thing. But at least you need to try to see it neutral and there is also a set of questions within the emotion set method that i would ask in person or that are also in the in, in, in the workbook that make it easier for an athlete or for anyone basically to accept those situations um, because there's something that i once heard and um talking to shaman and um, the question that I asked was, what is happiness? How do you define happiness? And you know what he said? He said, happiness is the ability to accept what is. And that was mind blowing to me. Like, Fantastic. This, that's it, it's that simple. It doesn't matter the situation you're in. If you've got the ability to accept what is, you are happy. And there is also a certain recipe for unhappiness that he told me. Do you want to know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said, if you want to be unhappy, do one thing. Start comparing yourself to others. Yeah, <laughs> because you will always find someone that is doing better than you, that is better looking than you, that is more intelligent as you. You will always find this. But if you're able to accept, it takes away so much pressure immediately. And it's a certain way or it's a certain path towards happiness. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, let's let's look at a couple of clubs that are. All right, if you're a club coach and you're looking at this here and saying, "All right, you're listening to this and saying, this is what we need to be working on." Um, I know you do individual stuff with players uh, remotely. Is there any club work resources that you would would you take a group of coaches in? Would you take a group of directors? You know, would you speak to a lot of people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the method that I created, the emotion set method, is suitable for not only for the athlete itself, but also for the parents. And I'm also working with parents, like with those. You um, you said it before, um, like the soccer mom and the soccer dad. That that's, that's uh, I think that's basically coming from the U.S. I'm, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I'm I'm currently working with with a soccer mom um, um, where 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 the boy is um, in, in, in LFC or um, no, in, in the Liverpool Academy. Mm. And um, it's very helpful to her as well because her son is really, really young. He's really, really young. And um, 
the like I would say it's a it's a good age to start doing this method or doing this kind of work with me as your coach once you turn like 14 15 that's like where it starts um but this doesn't mean that that a parent or a coach um cannot do it because i believe that we always need to lead by example right so we as coaches you as a head coach or the, the mom as a soccer mom um she needs to lead by example and it's the same thing if we try if we try to tell our kids not to smoke because it's unhealthy and we are smokers ourselves um it's probably not going to work as well yeah i i think this is um this is really important to 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 lead by example and um that's the reason why it's why it's also possible for for moms and dads and 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 coaches to to use this to use this method yeah yeah what what, what advice would you have for let's say a coach is listening and they're going to on their way to practice or they're about to start the week and they're saying all right i want to be more deliberate about awareness surrounding mental health um players dealing with stress pressure anxiety that's my goal this week what, what where would they start yeah well i would say try to um try to be um as open and as um as much in contact with the players from a human perspective as possible. Um, try to ask them questions. If you feel like I didn't ask my players any question for a very long period of time, try to take them in individually and um, try to talk to the player individually. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be possible to do to do that with every player in one day. But if you're if you're saying okay, I take a full week where I try to talk to each player individually and really ask him how he feels and how he's doing and how he's coping. What about school? What about mom and dad? And you know, just be interested in the person, because as coaches, what we try to or what we tend to be is by educating people all the time. We are kind of like we try to be interesting instead of being interested but as soon as we start asking it flips around the this sort of um yeah coach to player um coach to player interaction you start to be interested in the player and this is this would be a brilliant step for me um that 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 i would suggest do and um I, when I look back and when I look back to my own professional goalkeeper coach, um, not my dad, but what, what he did, um, um, what he did was he asked me a lot about those things. And this made me feel good because I felt under, I felt like he took me serious and I felt very, um, I felt like on the same level, although he could have been almost my grandfather. Yeah, it's amazing when when somebody cares and someone spends time with you. It's amazing what that does to the person. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I, you you know what just comes into my mind is what Otmar Hitzfeld once said, the former coach of Bayern Munich. So I grew up with this with, in this period where where Bayern Munich and Otmar Hitzfeld was was having great success, and um, I think it was Stefan Effenberg who said it. I'm not 100 percent sure. But he said that Otmar Hitzfeld told the team, he told them, guys, the dressing room is your space. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna invade the dressing room. You're gonna handle your stuff within the team yourself because I trust you on that. Okay. So by doing this, of course, he knew that he had players like Oliver Kahn, like Stefan Effenberg, like Michael Tarnat, those were the players that took a lot of responsibility away from the coach when it came to building a team. And I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this is an interesting way to do it, right? Giving young players 
the confidence and the trust that they deal with this situation themselves. And I don't know how much they talked about their emotions at that time. I'm pretty sure they did not do that too much. So this is something that I would add. This is something that I would try to add as coaches these days. Um, try to create this safe haven of, 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 of making the whole team um, be aware of that we are a team and we support each other and that it's okay to talk openly about our emotions and about our feelings. And if, we're, if, if we don't um, talk about it with the whole group, at least let's talk to the coaching staff individually. But this also means at the same time assuring the player that this is not going to be interpreted as a weakness. Because I think this is what, what, what hinders or what blocks a lot of players to come forward, to express their emotions. Because they still feel like if they do, they get replaced by someone else. And we need to address this as coaches, telling them that it's not the case. I'm not going to exchange you just because you are openly telling me about your emotions. If I see that you're working on your emotions, and this is a great advice for players that are not playing frequently, I would say, but that, that, that are not playing from, that are not playing the whole 90 minutes, minutes or that are players that, that come on as a substitution, is to make, to make them aware of the fact that they are still a very important part of the team and it's important how they react when they are not playing. It's, a, it's important how their body language is when they, are on, when they are sitting on the bench, because also their body language influences everyone else around them. There is a frequency that we emit all the time. And if we, are, if we give the, the feeling as, as a player who is not playing, if, if, if we give the whole team the feeling that we are pissed, and that we don't care and that it's basically it's all about us um, this creates some sort of bad feeling within the whole team so um, yeah i think that's something that that can be improved in almost every football team and almost every soccer team if if you look at professional teams um, and if you look at, at at body language of players um, it's 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 easy to spot that there is that there is a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> what are some what are some ways coaches can can find you, Stefan? Reach out to you. Uh, what's the best way for them to to kind of move the process forward if they listen here and they want to they want to kind of uh, follow on the conversation? Um, they can visit visit my website. Um, I'm sure you're gonna you're gonna give yeah, the link. To yeah, we're gonna put everything all the links below. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Or send me an email. That's the easiest way to get in contact with me. Um, ask me questions. Download my free ebook. I'm gonna I'm gonna have it online for for some more weeks um, to be able to download the whole ebook. Um, not just a part of it, but a, but the whole one. So take this advantage and really download the whole thing, because this is the most comprehensive ebook, the most comprehensive free ebook that you will find um, online. Um, that is based around emotion sets and emotions for for athletes. So take that advantage and get in contact with me. Ask me questions. Um, book a free coaching call. And yeah, if you feel like um, there is um, I can I can be um, I can be a help to you as a player or to you as a coach. I'm 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 happy to to work uh, together with you. Fantastic, fantastic, Stefan. First podcast, absolutely <laughs> outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary, for the great questions. 